Hello there. I want to take this time to invite you to join me for the next half hour for Minister in Warfare for the Lord. My opening scripture is taken from the 11th chapter of Genesis and the 1st through the 9th verse. At one time, the whole world spoke a single language and used the same words. As the people migrated eastward, they found a plain in the land of Babylonia and settled there. They began to talk about construction projects. Come, they said, let's make great piles of burnt brick and collect natural asphalt to use as mortar. Let's build a great city with a tower that reaches to the skies, a monument to our greatness. This will bring us together and keep us from scattering all over the earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower the people were building. Look, he said, if they can accomplish this when they have just begun to take advantage of their common language and political unity, just think of what they will do later. Nothing will be impossible for them. Come, let's go down and give them different languages. Then they won't be able to understand each other. In that way, the Lord scattered them all over the earth, and that ended the building of the city. That is why the city was called Babel, because it was there that the Lord confused the people by giving them many languages, thus scattering them across the earth. And even during this early stage of recorded human history, the devil was sowing seeds of discord between mankind and God. And the one element that the devil did his utmost to nurture and to cultivate, to literally try to strangle and destroy that relationship between God and mankind, was the element of pride. And as man achieved a certain amount of success, he seemed to develop within himself a need for self-glorification, and this need on his part led him to want to create some visual or physical evidence of his greatness. And so these early ancestors of ours said to themselves, Let's build a great city with a tower that reaches to the sky, a monument to our greatness. And that last statement revealed the fatal flaw in their personality and their thinking that caused a breach in their relationship with God. For they sought not to glorify God, but themselves. And had there been a spirit of humbleness on their part, God would have been there to protect and to rescue them. But because they allowed the spirit of pride to dominate their mindset, God reacted in an entirely different way. Just as in the laws of physics, for every action, there's a reaction. And this principle applies in the spiritual realm as well. If you do it God's way, he'll bless you. But if you disobey God's laws and commandments, you will pay the price for your transgression. For in 2 Samuel, the 22nd chapter, in the 28th verse, it tells us, You rescue those who are humble, but your eyes are on the proud to humiliate them. And one of the wisest men who ever lived, King Solomon, tells us through his writings that there will be consequences you will pay for allowing pride to be the dominant force in your life. For in the 29th chapter of Proverbs and the 23rd verse, and the 16th chapter of Proverbs and the 18th verse, King Solomon tells us, pride ends in humiliation while humility brings honor. But if pride supersedes humility as the dominant force in your life, then there is even greater consequences to pay 
For if pride continues to be a part of your life, then destruction is inevitable. For pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. And a life that is devoid of God's presence, protection, and instructions is like a ship without a rudder in a violent storm that's totally at the mercy of the elements and whose final fate will be that of destruction. And so to avoid having your life becoming plagued by disaster and destruction, you need to follow the advice that's given to us in the third chapter of Proverbs and the fifth through the eighth verses. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all that you do, and he will direct your paths. Don't be impressed with your own wisdom. Instead, fear the Lord and turn your back on evil. Then you will gain renewed health and vitality. Those were words of wisdom from King Solomon. But one whose wisdom far exceeds that of King Solomon echoes the same sentiments in the 29th chapter of Jeremiah and the 11th through the 14th verse. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. In those days when you pray, I will listen. If you look for me in earnest, you will find me when you seek me. I will be found by you, says the Lord. And God is saying to you, if you look for him for direction, he will give you clear and concise instructions that will lead to your success. But if you choose to reject God's instructions, then you will be inflicted with a condition which is common unto man and which is also the title of my sermon. Though you have eyes to see and ears to hear, yet you lack understanding. You know, about a year ago, I stopped at Walmart where I purchased a radio cassette recorder that I was in need of. And after completing my shopping excursion, I went home where I proceeded to open the box that the radio was in. And on the box itself, there were some instructions from the manufacturer that said that whoever bought their product should read the instructions before they attempted to play the radio cassette recorder. Well, my initial plan was to quickly read through the instructions and then begin to dictate the first draft of my sermon on my cassette recorder. But as Robert Burns, the Scottish poet, once said, the best laid schemes of mice and men can suddenly go asunder. As I picked up the instruction pamphlet and was about to read the instructions, it suddenly dawned on me, although the words were composed of the 26 letters of the alphabet, yet I could not comprehend or have any understanding of what the words meant. And most of the leading linguists will tell you that the average adult has a vocabulary of between 25,000 and 50,000 words. But despite that fact, as I tried to read the instruction pamphlet, I could not decipher any of the instructions that it contained. And the reason I found myself in this intellectual quandary was the fact that the instruction pamphlet that I held in my hand was printed in Spanish. A language, uh, I'm sorry, a language that was totally, totally foreign to me and of which I had no comprehension of. Now my initial reaction was that the manufacturer of the radio cassette recorder must have mistakenly sent the, this group of cassette players to um, America by mistake. Instead of sending it to the 
Spanish countries. That was my first response until I saw another pamphlet, but this one was printed in English. And as I read the instruction, this panel contained, there was no difficulty in me understanding the meaning of the directions. And this incident helped me to understand to some extent how the people in Babel must have felt when they suddenly found themselves in a situation where they could not understand each other because God had diversified their language. And this chastisement by God was the direct result of the people forgetting to understand and to comprehend the vision God had for them. And that vision and the purpose for their very existence is explained to us by King Solomon in the 12th chapter of Ecclesiastes and the 13th and 14th verse, as well as the 29th chapter of Proverbs and the 18th verse. Here is my final conclusion. Fear God and obey his commandments, for this is the duty of every person. God will judge us for everything we do, including every secret thing, whether good or bad. And where there is no vision, the people perish. And doing it God's way instead of your own way is the key to pleasing God and causing an abundance of his blessings to flow into your life. And many times, even though you may be very sincere in your effort to please and to do God's will, your plans may be contrary to what God wants you to do with your life. The key to doing what is pleasing in the sight of God and remaining in his divine will is to make your life Christ-like by emulating the lifestyle of Jesus Christ, the Son of God himself. For the very essence of Jesus Christ's life and his ministry revolved around one thing and one thing only. And that was to please and to do the will of his heavenly Father. And how do we attain these attributes and characteristics that Jesus possessed and which are so pleasing to God? It's by studying the Word of God. And in it, you will find his teachings and his commandments. And if you allow them to penetrate into your mindset and into your heart, then it will place your life in the perfect will of God. Yes, Jesus Christ is the answer for the world today. For above him there is no other. Jesus is the way. The way that will lead you to the perfect will of God for your life. But it's unfortunate that today, just as it was in Jesus' day, there are people who are blind and deaf spiritually, even though they have eyes to see and ears to hear, yet they have no understanding. For their desire to promote their own agenda supersedes their desire to do the will of God. And this fact is made known to us by Jesus Christ himself in the 13th chapter of St. Matthew and the 13th through the 15th verse. That is why I tell these stories because people see what I do but they don't really see. They hear what I say but they don't really hear and they don't understand. This fulfills the prophecy of Isaiah, which says, You will hear my words, but you will not understand. You will see what I do, 